Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, as we uh, consider this uh, dialogue, we pray as always for insight and understanding into who you are and into who we are and into the relationships you're calling us into with you, with ourselves, and with each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's great to see everybody uh, here. It's been a season of traveling for a lot of us, and so for those who are coming back, last week we got started with basically the beginning of the church year with our collegiate kickoff, and we're thankful for our students who are all back with us as well. And uh, so for the travelers, welcome home. If you're new to Avon Hope, again, we just are thankful that you're here today. We are starting a new uh, teaching series here th this fall, and uh, we're using, as we mentioned before, as a kind of an outline, this uh, new book, God With Us, uh, an, an introduction to Adventist theology. And this is uh, John Peckham, who's a professor at Andrews University, the, uh, the, Andrew, the Adventist Seminary. Anyway, we want to kind of wrestle with our tradition, the Adventist tradition, for those who may be unaware at Church of the Advent Hope, is a part of a, a large worldwide tradition, the Seventh-day Adventist tradition. And we want to kind of wrestle with uh, what this tradition has taught throughout the years and how it relates to, again, our relationship with ourselves, with God, and with each other. So we're looking forward to this journey. Michelle's going to be taking the baton next, for the next two weeks. We've got Vadim coming up. We've got all kinds of good things. And so today we're getting started with this theme, God with us. And so in John chapter 14, our text of emphasis, we get the uh, ball rolling here with Philip, who is one of Jesus' disciples. And uh, the, Philip is the third of four questions in this uh, this the passage. So Peter got things started off and uh, with, with a question, and then we get a second question, and then we get Philip's question or, a, or, or, or a request, and that is that, hey, Jesus, if you would just show us the Father, then when everything, we can understand everything, we can understand who God is, and, uh, you know, we need this. We need this. And so uh, Jesus, as you, we just read, dr addressed him directly, uh, Philip, We've been spending all this time together. At this point, probably three years together, walking and talking through Judea. You've spent all this time together. Don't you get it? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And so Jesus is asserting something incredibly bold. He's relating himself to the Father, and this has very specific implications. Now, this was not the first time that Jesus had related himself in this way to God the Father. In fact, if you go back just four chapters to John chapter 10, uh, we get Jesus saying similar things again. Here, uh, this is Jesus speaking. This is John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. And then we read the narrative of what happened after that in verse 31. Uh, the religious leaders picked up stones to stone Jesus after he said this, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of you of these do you stone me? And they said, we aren't stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. All right, so uh, Jesus is very bold. He's affirming his relationship to the Father, but the religious leaders of Jesus' day knew that this wasn't just some family relationship. Jesus was identifying himself as, as God, and it was so infuriating to them. And so if you had any questions, you know, some people say, hey, you read the Gospels, and Jesus never really says, I am God, but here he is overtly saying that. I and the Father are one means he and God are one. They're one in the same. If you've seen the Father, you have... If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. This is his response to Philip. And so Jesus is asserting that God is now with the people. God has come down, he's become a man, and he is with the people. And it so infuriated the religious leaders that they wanted to throw stones at him. They wanted to kill him. All right, so this was a, a bold and contentious statement. Now, 
Uh, of course, this is not the first uh, time that a human uh, uh, asserted divinity about themselves. If you would, were to go just uh, a south of, of where Jesus was, down to Egypt, the Egyptians had a long history of their pharaohs asserting themselves as uh, divine figures. I'm excited to tell you tomorrow, I'm excited. Tomorrow I'm getting on a plane and I'm gonna fly to London and then I'm gonna fly to Cairo. I'm gonna miss you for three weeks, but I'm gonna have fun. Okay, so I'm gonna go to Cairo, I'm gonna hang out with the pharaohs, I'm gonna have a good time uh, down there and then I'm gonna go to Israel, it's gonna be a blast. I know you're sad that I'm going, but anyway. It's going to be fun. So I'm looking forward to going down and seeing the, the tombs of these pharaohs. By the way, they're all dead, and they remain in graves somewhere, as you may know, if their graves were not uh, unsettled and robbed. But the pharaohs asserted that they were divine figures. So this idea that uh, a man could be a god, it was not new uh, to Jesus. Uh, uh, conversely, there was also the idea of that men could become gods, right? So if you uh, go a little bit... Uh, west. You can go over to Greece from where Jesus was. And in Greece, you'd find, again, more mythological ideas about humans uh, becoming gods. In fact, this was uh, a popular part of Greek mythology was that uh, humans, if they were courageous enough or if they uh, were good enough, that they could become like gods. So you had the pantheon of the 12 gods on Mount Olympus. And if the 12 gods saw a human who was courageous or did things, they might, they might bless them and make them immortal and invite them up to Mount Olympus. And so Jesus was not the first to, to assert that a human was a God figure, nor uh, 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 both with the Pharaoh and the idea of the Greeks that a person could become God. Jesus' assertion, though, was not that a human could become God, but that God had become human. This is new to the story, that the great God of the universe, the great creator God, and this is what Jesus is asserting when he says, I and the Father are the one. The great creator God has now come down into the creation and has, has limited himself, has, has left all the power of being God-like. I mean, that was the idea. If you become a God, if you were in the Greek pantheon, you looked forward to becoming like a God, and then you got all this power. The idea of Jesus is God leaves the power behind. And so uh, humans have lived with this idea of being <laughs> a God for some time, but Jesus is kind of flipping the script and saying God now becomes a human and gets involved in the human in, in experience. And so Jesus' claim that God with us is unique. Uh, the power is left behind and God has come and gotten involved in the mix. Jesus' claim is different. And so God becoming a human. Back to that in just a moment. But first, as we continue or start this journey, we need to consider the big question that comes out of Jesus' assertion. So Jesus is asserting that he and the Father are inseparable. They are one. What you see Jesus do is what God the Father does. They are one. They are united. And God is now down with us, down in the mix. But that raises a serious serious question for them at the time of Jesus and for us today, and that is, if Jesus is God with us, why is the world so messed up today? If God is with us, if Jesus uh, established God's kingdom when he came in the first century as he asserted over and over and over again in the gospel narratives, why is the world so messed up? You would think that if God is with us, things would be different. The world would be a different uh, place. If Jesus is God with us, why is the world so messed up? You know, the reality is the state of the world doesn't seem to support the idea that God is with us, if we're completely honest, right? As, as people, and I don't know what your background is, but you have some religious inkling if you've come here today to worship on this Sabbath morning. We have to be honest with ourselves. Today. The state of the world doesn't seem to support the idea that God is with us. Just this week, you know, in Libya, 
right? 11,000, it's probably gonna be more than that once everything is sorted out. We're drowned in a, a flood this week, 11,000. We just remembered 9-11 uh, a couple days ago, a terrible event here in New York City. Uh, twice as many people, more than that, died in Libya from the flood uh, just this last week. The world is messed up. Uh, last night, you may have been watching the news, and I, I know Derek is involved in the investigation, but there, a one-year-old and, and, and three other children in a kindergarten in the Bronx were exposed to fentanyl, and the one-year-old died. Did you hear this story? And so the Bronx DA and Derek's office is up there trying to figure out exactly what happened. Horrific. Children shouldn't be dying like that. The world is a messed up place. Those are just two of the very sad things that are happening in this world. It, the world is a messed up place. And so the idea that God is with us is challenged by this reality that we see all around us where it doesn't seem like God is with us. Uh, maybe you've got things going on in your life where you're like, I wish <laughs> it felt more like God was with me. The job isn't working out or the bank account isn't as full as it needs to be, or I wish I was in a different apartment, or I wish I was with a different person, and it doesn't feel like God is with us. So the state of the world doesn't support the idea that God is with us in preparation for uh, today and talking and getting this, uh, this journey started for the fall. I did some research. Sometimes research leads to you know, old dusty theological books. Sometimes research leads to YouTube. And so I did some YouTube research this week and I uh, found a, uh, a video from Sam Harris. So ha Sam Harris is f from a prominent group of, uh, of atheists, right? They call themselves, there's, there's three others who call themselves the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse. It's a joke on you know, revelation terms, religious terms. And so uh, Harris, there's a video that somebody posted of Harris, short video. We may, we've got to post this on the, uh, the Advent Hope uh, network because it's really good. It's definitely worth watching. And the video is titled, he didn't title it this, somebody recorded it and then posted it as these things happen on YouTube. And the video is titled, Sam Harris Demolishes Christianity. That's a provocative uh, t title. Sam Harris Demolishes uh, Christianity. And so, eight minutes of him talking about why Christianity and why religion, it doesn't work. Why it doesn't make any sense. And you know what? Almost all of his points are good ones. All, almost all of his points are good ones. He's challenged by the idea of this world that is all messed up and says, how can we, you know, we, we pray for things, we pray for a parking spot, and we praise God for the parking spot, and 11,000 people are dying who, you don't think they were praying when the floods came? You know, how does this, this make sense? The evidence of the world doesn't support this idea that God is with us. And so, <laughs> this is challenging. Injustice uh, uh, reigns. Children die. The world is broken and hurting. It doesn't seem like God is with us. And then we keep going on. The monumental, miraculous signs that we read about in the narrative of the Bible story, they don't seem to be happening anymore. The, the Red Sea, we read in Exodus, it opened up and people were redeemed and saved right at the last moment. There was a, a bush that was, looked like it was burning and it never uh, uh, burned up. In the New Testament story, you have these uh, disciples and they're praying together and God's spirit comes and they're suddenly be able to be understood by people who speak different languages th than them. These incredibly uh, miraculous events, but this doesn't seem to be happening anymore. Is God really with us? We don't see these miraculous events taking place. Where is God? Is he really with us? Does Jesus' assertion match up with the reality? And then finally, there's the reality that unjust people seem to flourish in this world. Unjust people, see, I mean, this is a pretty devastating argument. It's an argument that's come up before when we think about this idea of God with us. Jeremiah, the great prophet, he raised this same concern. In Jeremiah chapter 12, 1, Jeremiah says this, You are always righteous, Lord. 
when I bring a case before you. Yet, I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Have you ever asked that question before? Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? See, we're not the first ones to ask this question. Wait, God is with us? And yet, injustice seems to reign in the world. It doesn't make sense. The, 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 the wicked flourish. Those who choose to do their own thing and be selfish, they flourish. Job continued this theme. This is Job chapter 21. He goes even further. He says this. Why did, he's talking to God. He's wrestling with God. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not on them. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows calve and don't miscarry. They send forth their children as a flock. Their little ones dance about. They sing to the music of the timbrel and the lyre. They make merry to the sound of the pipe. They, spread their years in pro they sip, spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say to God, leave us alone. We have no desire to know you. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? Job is asserting the same concern. <laughs> what is going on? God is supposed to be with us, and yet people who have chosen not only just against God, but against other humans continue to flourish. I used to be a, a fan of uh, football. I am no longer a fan. That's a story for another day. Uh, but uh, part of the, the deal was that uh, my team was the team from Washington, D.C. They had a name, an offensive name. They've given that up to another name, and now they have a ridiculous name. They can't figure it out. They had, I don't like to spend time judging people, but they had an owner for 20 some years who I just, by all accounts, not a great guy. You know, one example is they have cheerleaders. And so some of the big donors to the football team, they took them down to the islands and the cheerleaders were asked to go down. And then the cheerleaders' passports were removed <laughs> and they had to hang out with the the big donors for the, the team. Gross. These are the kind of things that this, uh, this owner was perpetuating in his organization, okay? Well, recently, much to the excitement of the Washington fan base, this owner decided after long controversy that he was going to sell the team. There was rejoicing in the streets of Washington, D.C. There was hope in the air. And so he sold the team and went back to his estate in England with $6 billion, which he sold the team for. Why do the wicked prosper? It's the same question that Jeremiah and Job are asking. This doesn't make sense. The claim is, the claim of Jesus is that God is with us. He's come down. Jesus and the Father of one, Jesus' kingdom has been established, and we live in a world that just proves itself over and over and over to be unjust and broken and messed up. How do we have faith in such a context? How do we have faith in a broken world that doesn't seem to be getting better, where injustice continues to reign, and every step forward, we have two steps back. We make progress in technology and medicine, but we step backwards in ethics and morality and justice, it doesn't seem like God is with us. How do we have faith in this context? This is the work <laughs> of our journey over the next few weeks. We're not going to answer it today. I was joking with Michelle that she's going to have to answer that next week and the week after, because I'm going to be in Cairo. So we'll leave that up to Michelle next week. But let's consider this. How do we have faith in a world that is so broken, that does leave so many answer, so many questions about whether God is with us? Well, Jesus gives us a hint. Uh, Jesus says the starting point is to look to the work that he does when he is on the cross. John chapter 12, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself, Jesus said. Jesus is inviting us in our times of uncertainty. In our times where we're like, 
It doesn't seem like God is very present. It doesn't seem like God is with us. The world is a messed up place. Jesus invites us to do one thing, and that is to look through his work on the cross for us. Because in that work, we learn very specific things about God. The death of Jesus reveals things about who God is and what God does. First of all, God feels. God feels. It's a big deal. Uh, the, the Greeks of ancient times did not have this understanding of the, of the gods. The, the gods were off and removed. They didn't feel. Furthermore, uh, the, the, the death of Jesus on the cross shows us that God suffers. See, because if God and the Father are one, as Jesus keeps assert, asserting, uh, th- by the way, there's a Christian idea that we should note, and that is that the, God and the Father are separate. They have these separate roles, and that uh, God is doing the punishing. The Father is doing the punishing. And he has to sit back and be the God of justice, and he punishes his child, uh, uh, Jesus. And that's to maintain justice. This is not the idea of Jesus. This is not the idea of the Christian God. Jesus said, we, we are one. And so when Jesus suffers, the Father suffers because they are one. Their experience is one. God suffers. God feels. God is not unpassable. This is another Christian idea that we should abandon, that we should get rid of. The idea that God is impassable and he doesn't experience emotion. It's it's ridiculous. Jesus, on the night before he's dying, going to die, he's in the garden and we're told that it was so stressful and so challenging that his sweat was blood. He was sweating blood. God feels. God suffers. But most importantly, God cares. God cares. He's down in the mix, in the mud, in the blood, in the mess. And so not everything is answered. Why things are the way they are. Why the world continues unjustly, even though Jesus has established his kingdom. Why we can have a God with us, but everything isn't perfect yet, is left as somewhat of a mystery. We don't have all of the answers. We're going to wrestle with them over the coming weeks, but we don't have all of the answers. But Jesus invites us, when we don't have the answers, to continue to look to the work that he did for us when he died on the cross. And then after his death, after resting in the grave on the Sabbath day, he got up and was resurrected, and people saw him. People saw him. When you go to visit the pharaohs, they're still in the graves. Jesus has come out of the grave. This is the great hope that we have. And so even though everything is not neat and tidy, and the world is a broken place, and there are people who are praying and still suffering, we can look to the work of God and Jesus on the cross, and that he rested in the grave, and that he came back to life, and we can live with hope, even though we don't have all the answers. And so as we begin this journey, may God give us this hope and this faith that can help us to move forward even though we don't have it all figured out and even though we live in a broken world and even though you may be experiencing brokenness right now that is unsettling. May God give us this hope and this faith today. In him we pray. Amen.